Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with enormous pleasure that I welcome each and every one of you here today to this, the Wallace Worth Lecture for 2009. In welcoming you, we acknowledge the Aora people on whose traditional land we are gathered, their elders, past and present, the custodians of this land. We're very proud that this university, as a place of scholarship and research, is involved with and open to its community and Australia generally. And the Wallace Worth Lecture, the series which commenced 45 years ago, when this university was only 15 years old, is a vital part of our commitment to bring excellent speakers to a broad audience here on our campus at Kensington. The lecture series itself commemorates the memory of the late Wallace Charles Worth. He was the first president of the Council of the New South Wales University of Technology from which we evolved, and he became the first chancellor of this university itself. I want to particularly welcome Megan and Lucy Worth, both of whom are members of the Worth family. It's terrific that you're here today, carrying on a tradition that the Worths always turn up to these sort of lectures, so thank you very much. The first lecture was delivered in 1964 by the then Prime Minister of Australia, the Right Honourable Sir Robert Menzies. I might say that either that day or shortly thereafter, he opened what is now the library building just up the way there. The lectures themselves have addressed a broad range of topics, including ethics, justice, education, the 21st century, peace, post-communist Europe, and university teaching and research. Those giving the lectures over the years have come from varied backgrounds, but all of them have been prominent and distinguished in their areas of expertise. Our previous lecturers have included the Dalai Lama, Jose Ramos Horta, James Wolfenson, the Right Honourable Lord James of Rushholme, the artist John Parsmore, Jerry Adams, Professor Noam Chomsky, and Professor Hugh Stretton. The tradition of excellence in our speakers continues tonight, and we welcome very truly Dr. David Kilcullen who I'm pleased to note is not just a member of our alumni, but a double member. I hope that's an example many will follow. To introduce Dr. Kilcullen, I now call upon Professor Martin Krieger, who is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory and the coordinator of the Centre for Interdisciplinary Studies of Law here at our law faculty just down the way. Professor Krieger. <clears throat> Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, which I guess means all of you, and Dr. Kilcullen. It's a cliché to say that I feel privileged to introduce Dr. Kilcullen, but clichés can be true, and in this case it is true, and there are two reasons for that. One, a general reason I would share, I think, with anybody else who was invited to, to uh, accept this privilege. Uh, it's, it's nice to rub shoulders with history. Secondly, though, there is a more personal uh, connection between Dr. Kilcullen and me, of which he's unaware, and which I only discovered at about 1 a.m. this morning. So I'll take this occasion, if I may, later, not too much later, to reveal this connection to him and to you. But first, the general reasons for delight that Dr. Kilcullen has accepted the university's invitation to, to give this lecture. Everybody who reads the newspaper, and that's obviously everybody in this room, over the last few years will have read of Dr. Kilcullen's extraordinary access to the highest positions of influence in the United States and therefore in the world, senior advisor to General Petraeus, to Condoleezza Rice, to now, about to be, uh, to the general in charge of the 
Afghan campaign. But along with that, there are numerous other appointments as advisor in NATO to the Australian government, the UK, other governments. A great deal of his time, I understand, a great deal of it, more than, and more than uh, half of it, is now spent advising uh, NGOs in various fields in which he has that extraordinary expertise that he does have. And he works in Washington, D.C. for the Crumpton Group. Now, this array of attainments, of course, even though for people not in his field, it's, it's a surprise, or it was a surprise the first time I read of them, and a sort of patriotically nice surprise that some, one of ours has done so well and so importantly in the world. Of course, it doesn't happen in a moment or by accident. And in the intervening years, his career reached its peak already early when he got his doctorate from the University of New South Wales. But on his downhill run since then, there have been quite what other people might have regarded as remarkably influential papers, publications. I mentioned some of them, complex war fighting, countering global insurgency, counter insurgency redux, and very influential 28 articles. All of these, I understand, had an enormous influence within the uh, military world in redefining and resituating or newly identifying many of the challenges that people involved in counterinsurgency have to, have to fight. So for these reasons, simply and alone, it would be a delight that to, it will be a delight uh, to hear him. But this lecture, the Wallace Worth lecture, this time also doubles as a keynote address for a symposium that I've been involved with and several other people here uh, for, the, for today and tomorrow. And that symposium is on catalyzing the rule of law in Afghanistan. Not an easy thing to do, it appears. The idea for that was the idea for that symposium was suggested by my friend, colleague, and student in that order, uh, Whit Mason. It was taken up enthusiastically by our dean, by the university, and by our co collaborating hosts, the Asia Pacific Civil Military Centre of Excellence from the Australian government. It was the f first large child of a new centre in the university based in the law school, which is the Centre for Interdisciplinary Studies of Law. That centre was in many ways uh, inspired by a similar centre at uh, University of California at Berkeley, the Law and Society Centre, and within it, the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program, with which I've been involved for some 30 years. And it seeks to identify and to examine, explore problems, legally related, law-related problems, where legal expertise is simply not enough to do justice to the difficulty and the complexity and the variety of the problems involved. The rule of law is one such problem, as we saw graphically in the, in the symposium today. Simply to get a better piece of legislation or to try to train a judge is to do nothing about achieving the rule of law in a country beset by turmoil in various other ways. So it takes some th thought, not necessarily doctrinal legal thought, how to do it. Similarly, we learn from uh, David Kilcullen's book, the, the extraordinary book, The Accidental Gorilla, that to engage in war in modern times needs far more than a traditional military piece of intellectual equipment. It needs a larger array of intellectual disciplines brought to bear, and it needs and it requires what he calls conflict ethnography, a real understanding of the people in whose lands you're fighting wars, against some of whom you're fighting, but against others, or with others, you hope to cooperate. Reading that book, I was put in mind of another book, uh, now a great book by a great American sociologist. The book was called The Organizational Weapon. And it took, occurred to me, it is now completely forgotten, and unjustly so, the author was a, an American sociologist, Philip Selznick. It occurred to me when I was reading David's book that there are many similarities, even though the books are radically different, even in the cadences of the title, The Accidental Gorilla, The Organizational Weapon. And Selznick was interested in his book in explaining how it was that communists, what were the organizational strategies that communists could use to turn what he called recruits into fully deployable agents 
post office can't do that very well with its employees, and I won't ask the Vice Chancellor how easy it is to do in a university, but communist parties did it regularly all over the world. David also is interested in how so many people in so many of the countries where wars are now being held are recruited, and he finds that a lot of the traditional uh, wisdom on this is not so wise. I thought there was this parallel, I thought I was touched by it, and then uh, early this morning I read, as one does, an article on David in the New Yorker by George Packer where it was revealed that he was influenced particularly by two books, two old books. One was Eric Hoffer's um, The True Believer and the other one was Philip Selznick's The Organisational Weapon. After he wrote that book, Selznick sent up a, a thing called the Center for Law and Society in Berkeley, and then the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program. For the last 30 years, I've been very close to him, and I'm finishing, though I use that word advisedly, I've used it before, a book on his ideas. He's now 90, he's very frail, he's blind. He published his last book ever uh, last year, A Humanist Science. But it will be with real delight, and a very personal delight, that after this symposium is over, I'll ring him and tell him, I hope to tell him, uh, that long after he thought nobody had heard of him and long after he thought nobody had heard that book, it still manages to inspire somebody of this uh, achievement, accomplishment and importance in the world. And I introduce him now, uh, David Kilcullen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chancellor, and <clears throat> thank you, Martin. I have to say I am slightly disturbed to find you Googling me at one o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> perhaps we can talk about that later. And actually, I was, I was even more disturbed when I read the background to this lecture and realized the sort of caliber that, uh, of people that have done it in, in the past. Um, some of them immense uh, intellectual luminaries and others, of course, uh, disreputable rogues. And as a double graduate of the university, I'm very happy to be here tonight and adding to the rogues side of the ledger. Um, speaking of local rogues, what I thought we might do is start by talking about something that happened about 2,800 years ago um, on the far western edge of the great Iranian plateau near Sarez in the uh, Zagros Mountains on the west of Iran. Then we're going to take a virtual detour through counterinsurgency theory and the theory of state formation, uh, and then travel by way of the Horn of Africa uh, to the eastern side of the Iranian plateau around the city of Kandahar uh, this year in 2009. So we're going to cover about 3,000 uh, uh, years and about 5,000 miles in 45 minutes. Um, so I ho hope you can keep up. Um, I, want to, I want to start by referring to Herodotus's account of a character known as Deokes. And Herodotus of Halicarnassus, the father of history, uh, writing in the 5th century BC, uh, in book one of his histories, gave an account of this guy, Deokes, um, who he identified as the first king of the Medes. Here's what Herodotus had to say. There was a certain Mede named Deokes, son of Freortes, a man of much wisdom, who had conceived the desire of obtaining to himself the sovereign power. In furtherance of this ambition, therefore, he formed and carried into execution the following scheme. As the Medes at that time dwelt in scattered villages, without any central authority, and lawlessness in consequence prevailed throughout the land, Deokes, who was already a man of mark in his own village, applied himself with greater zeal and earnestness than ever before to the practice of justice among his fellows. It was his conviction that justice and injustice are engaged in a perpetual war with one another. He therefore began his course of action, and presently the men of his village observing uh, him to be uh, a wise and in, uh, man of integrity, chose him to be the arbiter of all their disputes. Bent on obtaining the sovereign power, he showed himself to be an honest and upright judge. And by these means, he gained credit with his fellow citizens so as to attract the attention of those who lived in the surrounding villages. They'd long been suffering from unjust and oppressive judgments, so that when they heard of the singular uprightness of Deokes and of the quality and equity of his judgments, they joyfully had recourse to him in the various quarrels and disputes 
that arose, until at last they came to put their confidence in no one else. Now what Herodotus is describing here is a leading member of local civil society, a man of mark in his own village, as Herodotus says, using the delivery of justice, dispute resolution, mediation, settling of disputes among the community as a means to acquire local legitimacy and political power from the bottom up in a traditional society. That is one, as Herodotus says, where people lived in scattered villages without central authority. Herodotus goes on, the number of complaints brought before him continually increasing as people learnt more and more of the fairness of his judgments. Dioke's feeling himself now all important announced that he didn't intend to hear any longer any cases. Thereupon robbery and lawlessness broke out afresh and prevailed across the country even more than before. Whereupon the Medes assembled from all quarters and held a consultation on the state of affairs. The speakers, as I think, were mainly friends of Dioke's. Little snide aside from Herodotus there. We cannot possibly, they said, go on living in this country if things continue as they now are. Let us therefore set over us a king so that the land may be well governed and we ourselves may be able to attend to our own affairs and not be forced to quit our country on account of anarchy. The assembly was persuaded by these arguments and resolved to appoint a king. So Diocles is now controlling and manipulating the security environment, making it more or less secure, um, and starting a process of transitioning from local justice to bottom-up state formation, translating the social good of dispute resolution and mediation into popular support, and then into the formal authority uh, and political structure of a state, in this case a monarchy. It followed to determine, Herodotus says, who should be chosen to the office. When this debate began, of course, the claims of Diocles and his praises were at once in every mouth, so that presently all agreed that he should be king. And thus Diocles collected the Medes into a nation and ruled over them alone. Now, I'd like to thank my father, Professor John Kilcullen, for drawing my attention to that particular passage from uh, Herodotus. And we should say that you know, classicists, archaeologists, and historians are a little bit uh, in disagreement about who this fellow Dioces actually was. As I've said, um, Herodotus identifies him as the king of the Medes. Um, he may be the same guy as Dauku, who's a guy who's referred to in the Assyrian cuneiform text from the reign of Sargon II in the 8th century BC, which is an area called Manea, just on the western edge of Iran, just east of the Iran-Iraq border. Uh, and in fact, Diako, which is the same name as Dioces, is quite a common name among Kurds in northern Iraq and Afghanistan. So maybe. Um, but what we can say, and we'll come back to this in a bit more detail later, is that Herodotus seems to be tapping into something that's a pretty long-standing trend, one that links the origins of insurgency warfare with the origins of the state and the origins of uh, the rule of law. Local non-state actors gaining influence through the local exercise of law and order, especially dispute resolution and mediation and then translating that influence into formal political authority through processes of state formation from the bottom up. Now, I warned you we'd be taking a detour into counterinsurgency theory, but I promise to make it um, as painless as I can. Bernard Fall, French counterinsurgency theorist of the 1950s and 1960s, wrote in 1965, a government that is losing to an insurgency is not being outfought, it's being outgoverned. That's one of the neater expressions of an insight that's fundamental to classical counterinsurgency theory, namely that insurgents challenge the state in two ways. One, by making it impossible for the state to carry out its functions, and two, by usurping the functions of the state. Uh, most commonly, local level, political legitimacy, the rule of law, a monopoly on the use of force, the collection of taxes, control of movement, regulation of the economy, all those sort of local level governance functions. Robert S. Thompson and David Galula, who are two important theorists of that period, talked about counterinsurgency as a competition for government, with both the state and the insurgent movement trying to mobilize and control the population. Here's what Fall said, and he's talking about the Nazis here at one point. He says, the communists, or shall we say any competent revolutionary warfare operator, the French resistance, the Norwegian underground, or any other European anti-Nazi resistance movement, most of the time used guerrilla tactics not to destroy the German army, 
of which they were completely incapable, but rather to establish a competitive system of control over the population. A competitive system of control. I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, Bernard Fall fought in the French resistance, as we said, uh, in World War II. He later fought in French Indochina, and he was killed in February of 1967 as a counterinsurgency researcher uh, in South Vietnam. About 20 years after Fall was killed, a guy called Joel Migdal wrote a book uh, called Strong Societies and Weak States, which was a study of the function of the state in society in the third world. Um, and Migdal took a deeper look at the functioning of states in strong societies. Now, if you accept the basic Fall, Galula, Thompson argument that counterinsurgency is a competition for government, then it becomes really, really important when you're actually running a real counterinsurgency campaign to be able to compare the relative strength of the government with the insurgency that it's fighting. But that's actually really hard to do if you think in structural terms, because structurally, a government is extremely different from an insurgent movement. Governments have fixed locations, they have a capital, they've got provincial offices, uh, district offices, they've got a bureaucracy and a public service, um, they've got armed forces and police and so on. Whereas insurgents may only have a very shadowy network that's hard to see of sympathizers and supporters and cadres and maybe active fighters. They're usually a lot smaller than governments and it's often really difficult to figure out how many troops they can put in the field at any one time. So that makes it really hard to compare an insurgency with a government if you're trying to do that by looking at institutions. Well, Migdal solved that problem for us by taking a functional approach rather than a structural one. And he identified four basic functions that government has to perform if it's going to be effective. It has to penetrate society. It has to regulate social relationships. It has to extract resources, and it has to apply those resources to identified group ends. Now, those functions are relevant to any kind of government, irrespective of structure, including non-state governance systems like tribes and clans and families and so on. And of course, the functions don't have much to do with what kind of state you're talking about. And the beauty of that approach is um, that the same four functions are exactly the same things that insurgents have to do if they want to establish that competitive system of control that, uh, that um, Fall was talking about. So although their structure can differ, differ greatly from a government, an insurgent movement can be compared directly using this idea of this, the state in society and the functions of governance. Now jump another 20 years forward to, uh, not to 2006, and a guy called Stathis Kalivas wrote a book entitled The Logic of Violence in Civil War. Uh, came out just in time for the surge, and I was very lucky to have it with me. Um, he examined this exact same phenomenon from the standpoint of the third actor in the counterinsurgency triad, namely the local civilian non-combatant population. He used an exhaustive series of fieldwork studies based on a number of different conflicts, and he showed that one of our basic and most common assumptions about insurgency, which is that insurgent movements are strongest in areas where people support their ideology, and governments are strongest in areas where people have a positive view of the state, actually flips the causality of what actually happens. The insurgents aren't strongest where, they support, uh, where people support their ideology. People support their ideology where they're strongest. The state isn't powerful where people have a positive view of it. They have a positive view of the state where it's powerful. So what he actually showed was that, um, that support follows strength and not the other way around. That finding is really important for ideas like hearts and minds and the battle of ideas and so on, where you basically go out into the environment and you try to gain people's support by making them like you. Stathis Kaliva shows that it's not how it works at all. He's tapping into exactly the same thing that Herodotus is talking about when he's giving the example of Diochis, the fear of disorder and anarchy. And he shows that local populations in an insurgency are in a lethally uncertain environment. They're buffeted on all sides by different armed groups who are competing to get their support and are going to kill them or punish them if they don't give that support. And he shows how community leaders are forced to cooperate with whatever the locally strongest side happens to be, and that over time they get to uh, give their support to that side. Now, as an aside here, and we're going to talk about Afghanistan, 
uh, in more detail in a minute, but when I read Stathis Kalivas, it reminds me over and over again of conversations that I have had with Afghan leaders uh, at the local level over the last four or five years working in Afghanistan. One time last year, I was sitting with a district leader and 11 of his tribal elders, uh, and this guy had fought with the Taliban, and he'd just defected to the government side about 11 days before. Um, and we're all sitting down talking about the situation in the district. And I asked him, what made you decide to leave the Taliban and come to the government? And he said, oh, you don't understand. I wasn't with the Taliban before, and I'm not with the government now. What I was just trying to do was to protect my own people, and that's still what I'm trying to do. Before, we thought we were better off with the Taliban. Now we think we're better off with the government, but that could change. So clearly, um, that's a classic sort of swing voter approach, you know, taking the side that's strongest. Other people take a hedging approach. In both Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, I've worked with tribal groups where most families have one son fighting with the government and another son fighting with the Taliban as an insurance policy. So Stathis unpacks the motivation that drives people to behave like that. And his work shows that people will do almost anything and support almost anyone who can reduce that feeling of fear and uncertainty by establishing a permanent presence and creating a predictable set of rules and sanctions that allow people to know what they have to do to be safe. Even if the guidelines that are established that way are very harsh and oppressive, people actually prefer that to uncertainty and they will flock to the side that provides the most consistent and predictable set of rules and sanctions. Now obviously people don't want to be oppressed and they want to be treated kindly and they want to have a prosperous life. But as Stathis Kalivas shows, there are actually secondary considerations compared to having some kind of predictability uh, and understanding of uh, how to behave in order to be safe. Now we could describe what we're talking about here as a sort of theory of normative systems, you know, a system of rules and sanctions. Or following Bernard Fall's idea, we could talk about a system of competitive control. Now if you add into the mix what Migdal was talking about, the functionalist state in society approach, and you add Stathis Kalivas' insight that uh, support follows strength, not vice versa, and you know, maybe throw in Mao Zedong's observation about power grows from the barrel of a gun for good measure, I think you get to a pretty good understanding of what you have to do in order to prevail in a counterinsurgency environment. And it's something that I call the theory of competitive control. And to state it simply, well perhaps not simply but com comprehensively, the theory of competitive control says in irregular conflicts, that is in conflicts where one warring party or more is a non-state actor, the local armed actor that a given population perceives as being best able to establish a normative system for resilient full spectrum control over violence, economic activity and human security, that actor is most likely to prevail within that population's residential area. In other words, whoever does a better job establishing a resilient system of control that gives people order and a sense of security where they sleep is likely to gain their support and thus win that competition for government that we talked about. Now the expression resilient full spectrum control uh, matters here. Let me explain it by talking a little bit about Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, just like any other insurgent or terrorist group, were trying to gain control, establish this system of competitive control by manipulating and controlling uh, the population, specifically the Sunni population of Iraq, who they saw as their primary power base. And they did that through a system of rules and sanctions based on a particularly severe and deculturized version of Sharia law. And it included some pretty harsh rules, like if you smoke, we're going to cut your first two fingers off. If you're a woman and you push your headscarf back behind your hairline, we're going to throw acid in your face. If we think you're a spy, we're going to skin you alive in public. If you're a tribal leader and you won't work with us, we're going to bake your seven-year-old son alive in an oven. All those things actually happened in Anbar in 2006-2007, and in fact, I've left out some of the worst things that Al-Qaeda did. But the point, as I think you'll agree, is they maintained their dominance through terror, through a system basically of intimidation. They terrorized people and they had really tight control in areas where they could maintain that pall of fear over the population. And as Stathis Kalivas would have predicted, where there was a threat to the population, particularly from the Sunni, the Shia community, 
they ended up supporting al-Qaeda out of a belief that even al-Qaeda was better than extinction at the hands of the Shia community. So they established a really tight system of um, normative control. But it was brittle because it was in a narrow band. And al-Qaeda was basically a toggle switch. All they could do was cut your head off or not cut your head off. They basically could just intimidate. That was all they could do. Beyond that, they were basically incapable. And that made their control very brittle. And when we finally got in there and managed to break that control through terror that they had over the population, the people turned on them in a flash and swept them away and they were completely destroyed. A lot of the most brutal al-Qaeda guys were killed within minutes to hours by local populations that they had had under their heel until then. So they had no resilience. They were brutal because all they could do was intimidate. Now, contrast that with another couple of insurgent movements, and in particular Hezbollah. Hezbollah has a much more resilient, full-spectrum system of control. Sure, they have a terrorist wing and they will kill you uh, if you step out of line, but they also have a community militia that will protect you and keep crime down and act like a local police force. And they have charities that will help you if you're poor, and they can get you a job, and they can teach your children in their schools, and they can treat you if you get sick in their hospital and they can represent you in parliament because they've got a parliamentary political party. And you can watch their television channel, Amana, and listen to their radio and read their newspaper. Al-Qaeda were thugs, but Hezbollah and groups that operate like them, in particular Jaysh al-Mehdi in Iraq, Muqtada al-Sadr's organization, are actually much, much more than that. In fact, they're acting very much like governments at the local level, which again, government is essentially just another normative system based on wide spectrum uh, methods of control. So Al-Qaeda and Iraq and Hezbollah are kind of opposite ends of the scale. And the Taliban fit in between them. And as we'll see, they fit a lot closer to the Hezbollah end of the scale than to Al-Qaeda. And one of the areas that the Taliban have traditionally focused on, almost to the exclusion of others, is the rule of law. Now, speaking of normative systems, clearly the rule of law itself is the ultimate normative system of control. It lays down rules. It puts forward sanctions and punishments that go with each rule if you break it. It sets up a system of published regulations, which aids predictability and consistency. And it establishes a judiciary uh, in democracies, an independent judiciary, and a police force, prisons, magistrates, lawyers, uh, judges, and so on. And all of this in the interests of making people feel safe and secure through a standardized uh, and ordered normative system. And that is a huge factor in social stability. And ultimately, it's the basis for government. Rule of law in that sense, which is where I think Herodotus was going with the story of Diokes, is literally the foundation both of the state and of social order itself. Now, if Noam Chomsky or one of my other predecessors maybe Jerry Adams in delivering this lecture were here, um, this would be a great opportunity probably for them to interject and say, aha, you finally admitted it, you know, the state's just another protection racket. Um, and you know, you're no better or worse than, than, than rebels or insurgents or terrorists or whatever you want to call them because in conducting counterinsurgency, um, you're engaging in a fundamentally illiberal and oppressive activity because you're trying to establish a system of control just like the insurgents. And states with their police, uh, and their courts and armies and parliaments and everything else are just a better system and maybe they have control of the means of legitimacy, which uh, insurgents don't. Well, to respond to that imaginary point, I think that clearly drawing a moral equivalence between what insurgents do, as we've seen cutting heads off and baking children alive and so on, and what legitimate governments do, enforcing the speeding regulations, you know, upholding the tax code, arresting people for murder and rape and so on, um, is gravely misplaced. But functionally, it's not such a bad point. Because as Migdal would have it, there's actually a functional similarity uh, between w the rule of law, state building, what states do, uh, and uh, what insurgents do. And that's where the character of the state comes into play and becomes a really, really important factor in thinking about the characteristics of counterinsurgency. So we're nearly done with, with uh, counterinsurgency theory, but I just want to talk about some definitional stuff. Insurgency, according to current US doctrine, is an organized movement that aims at the overthrow of a government 
through the use of subversion and armed conflict, an organised, protracted politico-military conflict designed to weaken the control and legitimacy of an established government, occupying power, or other political authority, while increasing insurgent control. Now, the same document um, talks about counterinsurgency, and it says it, it's just an umbrella term that describes the full range of measures that governments take to defeat insurgencies. So counterinsurgency is just whatever you do to defeat an insurgency. And the measures that you can take can be political, administrative, psychological, informational, uh, and so on. They're almost always used in combination. There's no standard set of techniques for counterinsurgency. In fact, the particular approach that any government takes to this problem depends very much on the characteristics of that government. Now, we mentioned the Nazis earlier when I was quoting from Bernard Fall. So let me explain this by reference to them. There's a historian called Ben Shepard, who in 2004 published a great book entitled War in the Wild East, which is the first really detailed operational study of how the German army did anti-partisan warfare on the Eastern Front. And it's quite a revealing account. Um, he shows that many German commanders on the Eastern Front actually recognised the need to protect, uh, win over uh, and support the local population and treat them with respect and consideration so as to reduce support for the partisans. Shepard goes into a, a detailed, quite exhaustive series of studies at regimental and division level of the 221st Security Division, which operated behind uh, the um, Army Group East. And he said certain, I'm quoting here, certain Eastern Army figures, sorry, numerous Eastern Army figures already in 1941 saw the potential for support in a tentatively pro-German population. These are people who had just been liberated from Stalin. They also saw the need for a more sensible, measured prosecution of occupation and security policy in order to exploit it. This led some units all of the time and most units some of the time to engage in population security, hearts and minds and civic action that would be entirely familiar to any modern practitioner of counterinsurgency. Colonel uh, Reinhard Galen wrote in 1941, if the population rejects the partisans and lends its support to the struggle against them, no partisan problem would exist. That's a classic statement of best practice counterinsurgency theory. But here's the point. These commanders, even though they understood the technique, their efforts were continuously and constantly being undermined by the genocidal and rapacious nature of the Nazi state. And as Shepard says, the effectiveness of all these efforts was blunted by the fact that they never posed a fundamental challenge to the ruthless economic interests that led the Germans to despoil the East, leaving the population starving and destroying the economy, or to racist preconceptions of the population, which contributed to mass violence against non-combatants. Shepard says the ruthless, ideological, and exploitative nature of Nazi occupation policy proved an implacable obstacle to effective counterinsurgency. Walter Lecour made a similar comment. He said, partisan leaders would have found it much more difficult to attract recruits had the Germans treated the population decently. But that would have been completely out of character with the nature of the Nazi leaders, their doctrine in the Nazi state. So counterinsurgency mirrors the state that conducts it. And the concept of counterinsurgency can mean totally different things depending on what kind of state you're talking about and what state is carrying it out. And I would submit that that means that good states can carry out bad counterinsurgency if they get the technique wrong. But bad states can't do good counterinsurgency even if they get the technique right. Eventually, the nature of the state, as in the case of the Nazis, will undermine what they're trying to do. And you can see that if you look at what different countries do. Oppressive um, governments tend to enact very brutal measures to crush rebellions, but that sets up problems for the future. Um, military dictatorships tend to favour paternalistic um, martial law type solutions. Liberal democratic states have a different set of problems. They tend to be quick, perhaps too quick, to hand control to elected local civilian officials so they can return to normality. You only need to compare the, uh, the difference between Syrian President Hafez al-Assad's approach to crushing the Hama um, uh, uprising in 1980, where basically he levelled a whole town, or Saddam Hussein massacring the Kurds in Halabja in 1989, to the way the British conducted Northern Ireland, or the way even that we've operated uh, in some of the campaigns around the world. So I think counterinsurgency can be oppressive and inhumane, but it isn't necessarily so. It depends on the nature of the state that's conducting it. 
Okay, we're nearly done with theory, but I told you we'd go to the Horn of Africa. So I just want to look here in Somalia and Somaliland at the contrast between theory and reality, and in particular the difference between top-down state building and bottom-up state formation. Now, it may surprise you to, or not to know this, but in the past it's been very rare for counterinsurgency people to talk to uh, peace-building specialists or members of the international development community or rule of law experts. Now, that's been changing for a number of years. But one of the side effects of that academic stovepiping has been, even though Herodotus was writing about this stuff two and a half thousand years ago, we actually currently lack a generally recognised theory of opposed nation building or bottom-up state formation. And because of that, when the international community gets involved in these types of stabilisation or reconstruction missions, we often tend uh, to focus on top-down state-centric solutions that have a structural focus that looks at trying to put in place the institutions of a central state. And empirically, looking at what we've been doing over the last few years, those top-down approaches seem to be working a lot less well than bottom-up civil society peace-building approaches. Um, our current experience in Iraq, Afghanistan and the Horn of Africa, especially the difference between Somaliland in the north and Somalia in the south, suggests that bottom-up civil society-led programs that focus on peace-building, uh, reconciliation, the uh, connection of legitimate local non-state structures to state structures, sort of linking top-down with bottom-up, uh, have a much greater chance of stabilising an environment than the sort of top-down approaches that focus on working with local elites to create a new structure. Now, as Ian Lewis, who's a famous anthropologist, has shown, in Somalia since 1992, the international community has engaged in a series of total failures to institute top-down uh, state-building processes, uh, or nation-building, as it was called, uh, in Somalia. A lot of those efforts were captured and then perverted by local elites, the very same warlords that created the problem in the first place. Meanwhile, just to the north in Somali land, the former British colony, a series of local clan peace deals in 1992, no community, le community involvement from uh, outside, just those local clans, got together and basically signed reconciliation agreements. That led to district level charters and then regional charters, the formation of province government and then a national government of Somaliland in 1994. And that's resulted in a relatively high degree of rule of law, social order, prosperity, low level of crime and violence in that part of the country. Um, in fact, Somalia is virtually a laboratory test case with the South acting as the control group and the North acting as an experimental model because you've got exactly the same ethnic groups, the same clans, in some cases the same actual people coming out of the same civil war and the same uh, general history, although they had some different colonial experiences, and the same collapsed uh, state environment, and yet you see completely different results. One where the elites have captured the process, perverted it to their own ends, uh, and essentially feathered their own nest, and in the north, bottom-up state formation focused on peace building has led to a completely different result. Now, in 2007 in Iraq, we had the same thing happen. We went in with the surge with the intention to create security for Iraqis, which would then lead to a national level grand bargain where the different communities would come together. And that is not what happened. It was the opposite. What happened was a series of local bottom-up community-based peace deals um, that created peace and security at the local level with our security presence acting as a catalyst for people to feel safe, just as Stathis Kalivas uh, predicted and resulting in an improvement in security uh, overall from the bottom up. And again, civil society based, not national government based. And of course, local agreements that are enforceable are just another form of normative system, sanctioned by society and upheld in a very similar manner to rule of law. In fact, police, courts and a judiciary system, along with local representative councils, were some of the first institutions that these local communities found the need to create after they signed local peace deals. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't do top-down. What I'm saying is we do need to do that, but we need to link bottom-up processes to what we're doing from the top-down, otherwise you end up with a state that's disassociated from local governance structures. So finally we come to Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan we've seen exactly that. Um, international security 
assistance efforts have really focused on the national level of the central state, building police and courts and ministries and institutions at that central Kabul level. And international aid programs have become bogged down in bureaucracy, duplication uh, and inefficiency. And that created a, a vacuum at the local level which the Taliban filled while we were busy doing things like writing legal code and building a Supreme Court building and training attorneys and so on, the Taliban came in at the local level with a pre-existing legal code, the Sharia, and started administering justice just like they were at the local level. And they took over the functions of security, mediation, dispute resolution and community policing, not to mention bringing the world's most convenient cash crop in the form of the poppy to the Afghan farmer. So the Taliban successfully sidestepped our top-down effort and came in at the bottom uh, and were able to outgovern us at the local level. So to paraphrase Bernard Fall, in Afghanistan, the government is losing to the Taliban, not because it's being outfought, but because it's being outgoverned. Let me give you some examples. Across the south of Afghanistan today, there's about 15 Taliban Sharia law courts operating at the local level. Now, when you hear the term Sharia court, you might think of people having their hands cut off or women being stoned for adultery, um, beheadings and so on. And that does happen. But in fact, the majority of work of these courts is commercial or civil law rather than criminal law. They issue title deeds um, and they resolve land disputes. They settle water and grazing disagreements. They handle inheritances uh, and family law. They issue ID cards. Um, they even issue passports in the name of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Um, they basically deliver local governance, a local dispute resolution and mediation service. They have a reputation for harshness but also for fair and swift justice. In other words, the courts become part of a resilient full spectrum system of control like we talked about in respect to Hezbollah. They're doing precisely what Daokes did in the account of Herodotus. They're translating local dispute resolution and mediation into local rule of law and from there into political power. Our friend in Kandahar tells me there's a Taliban court just outside the city that formally subpoenas people to come and testify in court and they go even from within the supposedly coalition controlled urban centre of Kandahar city because they know if they don't go they'll be punished by um, Taliban enforcement squads that look and act a lot like local police. In fact, there's a silent campaign of intimidation, um, coercion and control happening right under our noses in a lot of urban centres in Afghanistan. Now, in Migdal's terms, the Taliban have penetrated society. They're playing a major role in regulating social relationships. They've also started extracting resources and applying those resources to identify group ends. That's the complete four functions of the state, according to Migdal. So Taliban tax assessors associated with the local Taliban governors whom the Taliban have appointed in every village and district go out on a regular basis and assess people's property and crops for payment of taxes and they go out and levy those taxes normally around 10 percent in a firm but generally equitable manner and in fact this year the grape harvest which is the main harvest in Kandahar was a little bit low and so the Taliban came out and said look we know we assessed you on 10 percent but we're going to charge you a little bit less this year because the crop was bad the Taliban TARP equivalent for the financial crisis in Afghanistan. So that's how the Taliban's governing. How's the actual government doing? Well, the Afghan government actually levies no taxes. Most um, Afghan government officials draw their income largely from corruption and drug money and shakedowns of the local population. There's no functioning local court system, partly because the Taliban displaced it, but also because we focused on the level of the central state. The government doesn't even have a presence in about two-thirds of the country, and where it does have a presence, the local representatives often tend to act so corruptly or so abusively towards the population that they alienate people. And that's even leaving aside the significant loss of credibility and legitimacy that will probably result from an election that just occurred, which a lot of people see as being fraudulent or uh, flawed. So in other words, in terms of Migdal's functional approach, the Taliban are the real government in a lot of parts of Afghanistan. So as Bernard Fall said, we can beat the Taliban in pretty much any military engagement, but we're losing in Afghanistan not because we're being outfought, but because the Afghan government is being outgoverned. And unless we take drastic action to counter corruption, 
prevent abusive behaviour by local officials, especially the police, reform local, local level structures, create legitimate uh, local government systems that can function uh, in the interest of the population, and then start connecting those, linking them to the central state, there's little doubt that we're eventually going to lose. Now, two other things that the Taliban have done really show that they understand this as well. Um, firstly, the Taliban have actually established last year, just north of Kandahar, an ombudsman committee where people can go and complain if a local Taliban commander does something that um, they find oppressive or abusive. And they can have a complaint heard by an independent committee, uh, half the members of which are not Taliban. And the Taliban commander that's involved will be punished, maybe even fired, uh, and, and the population gets compensated. Now, that push for fairness and accountability is a direct challenge to the governance practices of the Afghan government. What it's saying is the government will exploit you. The international community won't help you. The infidel troops are going to bomb you from the air, and there's nothing you can do about that. But we're going to treat you fairly, and we have accountability. Direct challenge. And the second thing they've done, which is kind of interesting, is they have a formal code of conduct. And it reads a lot like a military justice manual or a field service regulation. We first saw this emerge in late 2006, and in May this year we captured an updated copy of it. It's a set of rules, about 20 pages long, with guidelines for behaviour, uh, admonitions for how to treat the local population. Uh, it has a set of rules about how to be fair uh, in, in dealing with communities. And it lays out how Taliban groups are supposed to operate. It's a set of rules that the local people know. It's published. Um, and it's enforceable through this ombudsman system that we talked about. And taken together with the court system, that means there's actually a very high degree of accountability and, let's be honest, rule of law about the way that the Taliban does business. Now, don't get me wrong, the Taliban are coercive and intimidatory as well. They'll put a gun to your head and force you to do um, what they want. But then a lot of local drug, drug dealers and officials will do the same thing. And this is a competition. You don't have to be perfect, you just have to be better than the other guy. So now let me start uh, ending and sort of drawing together some of the threads we've been talking about. So we started with Herodotus talking about Deokes, and that account, I think, is something of an archetype. You know, whether or not um, Deokes really existed and was Dauku uh, out in Manea is kind of secondary. What this is is a semi-mythical description on the part of Herodotus about how the rule of law, the delivery of justice, and the establishment of locally legitimate presence becomes the foundation not only of social order but also of the embryonic state. And as Fall, Galula and Thompson showed, counterinsurgency is a competition for government. And as I discussed in reference to Migdal and Kalivas, you win that competition for government by penetrating society, regulating relationships through a, a normative system of rules and sanctions that create predictability and order for the population, makes people feel safe, and causes them to flock to your side. As the Nazi experience in World War II shows us, you can get things right at the tactical level, but if the state is fundamentally oppressive or corrupt or illegitimate, it really doesn't matter because the nature of the state will undermine you at every turn. Now, as I've said, this is a competition for control. The side that best establishes that resilient, full-spectrum system of control that can affect security, uh, the rule of law, and economic level at the local level is the one that's most likely to win. Control in a narrow band of intimidation is brittle and easily broken. But if you have a wide spectrum of control, it's really hard uh, to unseat that system. Now, as our current experience in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia has shown us, places where local people have taken a bottom-up peace-building approach based on local peace deals, uh, enforceable agreements among local community groups, and normative systems that pr protect the community from threats, in those places the results have been far better than in places where the international communities come in with a top-down approach that's focused on the institutions uh, of the central state. And yet that top-down approach does seem to be our default setting in dealing with these kinds of situations. So to conclude, let me just quickly touch on some of the implications of all that. Firstly, kind of an academic point, but counterinsurgency and counterterrorism people really need to start talking more um, with the peace building and development and rule of law community. Um, these academic and policy communities have been very stovepiped and separated for a long time. And the more we share our insights, 
the better we're going to do in the field. We need to look at our theories of top-down state building and recognise what the empirical evidence from the field is telling us, namely that bottom-up, community-based civil society approaches are much more likely to succeed than our favourite top-down style. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that we can do without top-down approaches, but it does mean we need to put a lot more effort into bottom-up issues and linking bottom-up progress to viable state institutions. Secondly, in terms of Afghanistan, this all suggests we need to put the top priority right now on anti-corruption, governance reform, and creating a functioning government at the local level and establish, establishing a sufficient security presence to make people feel safe where they sleep. Until now, we've had policies that basically focused on fighting the main force Taliban, chasing them around the countryside, uh, and also on extending the reach of the Afghan government. But as we've seen, it's not the main guerrilla units that are our problem, it's the units that are in the, the urban centres and are intimidating the population. And if our strategy is to extend the reach of a government that's corrupt and oppressing its people and people don't think is legitimate, the better we do at carrying that strategy out, the worse it's going to get. So I think finally we need to recognise that we're facing a crisis of legitimacy uh, founded on our failure to connect at the local level with ordinary Afghans. Our efforts have been captured by an elite, just like in Somalia. The same warlords that the Taliban overthrew in 1996 are now back in power. And that elite is doing what elites do. It's acting in an extractive and exploitative way towards its population. The election result that just happened really just undermined, or it's underlined that fact. And it made visible to the international community something that a lot of Afghans have thought all along. We need to ask ourselves what kind of Afghan state are we trying to build? And is it a kind of state that's going to be viable in this environment? Or are we in fact creating a state which is going to undermine uh, our counterinsurgency efforts? Now, I do not think the war is lost, and I don't think it's hopeless. Um, the additional troops and resources that we're putting in, the greater number of civilian specialists, more money, better leadership in particular, that the international community is really uh, putting into Afghanistan now, is going to create a window of opportunity it's not going to solve the problem, but it will definitely create a window of opportunity. We have to urgently seize that opportunity and use it to focus on fixing what's wrong at the local level with the Afghan government, or that window is going to close again. And all of our efforts will be for naught, and the cost to the Afghan people will be immense. Now, we can still turn this thing around, but we have to act now, and we have to focus, like we've been talking about, on governance, rule of law, anti-corruption, and protecting people at the local level. This isn't rocket science. In fact, most of what I've said tonight, I hope, is entirely obvious. Um, they're not original ideas, but translating these ideas into action on the ground is really, really difficult. It's easy to say, but it's really hard to do.